Hello, all my entrepreneurs and business leaders, and welcome to The Michael Esposito Show, where I interview titans of industry in order to inform, educate, and inspire you to be great. My guest today is an inspiring leader and the founder and CEO of Personal Rx, a revolutionary new way to get your prescription medicine. Please welcome Larry Margolis. Thanks for having me. Oh, very, very happy to have you, Larry. I, I have a lot of questions about okay. your tech company because tech is a space that, that I operate in. It's, I, I love it. I think that it's, um, I know, I mean, we all know that it's the future, right? Uh, but before we jump into Personal Rx and what you're doing there and how you're changing the uh, pharmaceutical industry, really, I'd like to learn a little bit more about you, what inspired you to be great, and, um, and what you're, how your, I guess, upbringing is uh, maybe played a role in where you are today as an entrepreneur. Sure. Um, well, I grew up with a, uh, in a family of entrepreneurs and lawyers, believe it or not, <laughs> um, and knew enough not to want to be a lawyer. No disrespect to lawyers. As my lawyer would attest, uh, you know, when I speak to him, he's like, I'm glad you're not a lawyer. <laughs> but um, uh, they, they obviously have a place. But my dad was always an entrepreneur. And uh, he, was in, he was an attorney who represented auto dealers, and he was an auto dealer which was sort of a difficult combination to, uh, to get together. Um, you can't sue a factory during the day and then uh, ask for more cars at night. Right. It just doesn't seem to work. So it's, uh, it was always a, a bit of a struggle. But in any event, he was an entrepreneur, um, and I always wanted to be an entrepreneur. I always loved building things, mm. um, whether it, you know back in the day uh, Legos or, or whatever it was. Um, I, I always liked building things. I always liked technology. I had my first uh, computer, uh, Radio Shack TRS-80, yes. when I was 13. Yes. Uh, they were out, and so I'm aging myself. Um, and I like to play with that. And it was always about what we can do with things and, and learning about software. And as I was talking to your producer earlier, uh, when I walked in this morning, uh, talking about software and SEO software, that was last night's project. So I always try and pick a project at night and learn about something new and how I can use it. I don't want to look at it just to add the features and function, but I'm always looking at things on what can I use this for right. and how can I build upon it. So I think I've been doing that since I'm a kid right? and taking things apart and putting them back together again. And uh, sometimes when I was really young, probably didn't put it back together again correctly. But <laughs> nevertheless, I knew how to take it apart. And it was, it was important to me to understand how things worked. And you take that and the entrepreneurialism and you put it together, and I think it's a, a good, pretty good combination. Yeah, it, it certainly is. I mean, that's pretty much what an entrepreneur is, is they're dissecting uh, what the problem is and then trying to figure out a solution. Exactly. Um, you used the word entrepreneur, and I know that that's a big uh, buzzword these days. But I'm just wondering, in your childhood, was, was entrepreneur the mindset that you had or thought that you had? Or was there a different word that you could kind of go back to and remember being the, the catalyst to where you are today? Geek. Geek? Okay. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm glad you say that because I was wondering, that brings us to the TRS-80, is, is again, going back then, PC, PCs and all that stuff, computers in the home, and, and I'm saying, I'm thinking, what, 70s or, right? That's correct, right? late P 70s. Right? So PC, PCs weren't really in the home at the time. So what drove you to the technology as a, as a young child? I love gadgets and, and I love playing with things and I love learning new things. And TRS-80 was the thing to have at the time or, or an Apple. I didn't go the Apple route okay. uh, then. Um, although in 1984, when the, when the Mac came out, I was a Mac user. Right. I've been a Mac user ever since. Okay. Um, and uh, uh, I like the technology and I like what it can do. I like to learn about it. It's, okay. it's, it's, it's hobby meets productivity. Okay. In a sense. And and so I say geek and and I use that term. Um uh I I I use that term not in an endearing way. Yes, like proud. Proud in yeah. a way. Uh, I'm not really that much of a geek. I don't write code by the way. Right. <laughs> but I know how to I know how the mindset works and how to design with it and and build upon it. Understanding it, yeah. Um, I'm going back to your your father and the entrepreneur in him, and and you said you grew up in a family of entrepreneurs. Um, what what in, inside of that, inside of them being entrepreneurs, did you pick up? What skills did you learn from them as a young child, seeing uh, these these people just making their own way in in the world? Hard work. Mm -hmm. Hard work. Yes, yeah, so it's you, worth it. You know, I, I remember. 
uh, telling tell my nephew years ago, and I don't know whether he appreciated it at the time, but I, I had sent him a letter when he started college, and I said, look, if I can tell you anything um, and teach you anything, uh, it would be that you got to work really hard because it's worth it. Okay. You know, and in fact, my son started college this year. Yes. And I, se- and I sent him the same kind of letter and the same concept of work really hard. I think um, hard work is, is the uh, beginning of what you can do. And I also think it's working smart. Okay. Um, and hard work is great. And, right. and, and, you know, but I also have a, an enormous respect for somebody who can sit down and knock something out in an hour. Right. But I believe truly that if you're going to do a project, and I say this at home all the time, do it right or don't do it. Mm-hmm. Go home. Right. Just do it right. Do it right. Do it once. Put the time in and, and get it done. And um, uh, don't skimp. Make that's, sure, that's my belief. Make sure you hit all the sides to it. So yes. while we're on your dad, um, I have work his deal as a quote that you put in your bio for me. Mm-hmm. Uh, what, what did that mean to you as a growing up and today? Uh, it meant just that, work your deal. Work with the situation you're in and what you have in front of you. Do your best. And, and it was figure of speech, work yeah. your deal, but it stuck with me. And, yeah. and you always want to do your best. And you always want to put your all into something. And that's working your deal. Yeah, making sure that everything is, is, is buttoned up and making sure before you go to market with it or anything like that. Yes. But the flip side of that is when you, t- when you speak about going to market is the Guy Kawasaki-ism of uh, 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 get the product out. Get it out the door and learn what people need and don't over engineer and never come to market. Right. So you want to be ahead and you want to do all of that work and you want to put your best foot forward. But at some point in time, you have to launch something and you have to see what the public is going to say. And, you know, to that, it's amazing that you, what you think is important isn't (laughs) and what you don't think is important. People really appreciate. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, um, it's that's I think it's such a great lesson for entrepreneurs. So again, I mean, you and I talked about this, but this show is geared towards our entrepreneurs and our business leaders, our entrepreneurs who are either launching a business or growing a business or trying to get to the next level, and our business leaders who are in an entry level position and trying to scale and go up the, the ladder, corporate ladder. And I think that that's really important for them to hear from an entrepreneur like yourself, who who is where you are today, to hear that. It's kind of like taking messy action. I've heard the term being used, That's right? Good, I like that. Taking messy action, but yeah. making making mistakes along the way, but launching. I mean, you and I, we we both have, you know, Steve Jobs, we talked about him and, and he talked about that too, is you wouldn't believe it in the products that he launched, but he knew that they could be better when he launched them. Mm-hmm. But he, he knew that he also had to make a decision to launch. Um, it, this just brings us naturally to something that you said as well, which is making mistakes foster success. And so I, th- I just think when I'm thinking of messy action, when I'm thinking about just you got to launch, um, why, you know, you mentioned Guy, Guy Kawasaki and he says that. What, what else in, in business do you see that being really important when you look at that and, and making mistakes and understanding them? I think it's, I think it's critical to learning. Uh, yeah, you need, you're not going to be perfect, right? And, you know, it's, it's another thing that I always teach my kids. Um, and you speak about work your deal. I, I, when, it's, when it comes to my kids... I, I kind of say the same thing. I want you to work really hard. I don't care if you get B's, C's, or A's, or D's. I just want you to work as hard as you possibly can and right. get the most out of it. And when you're building something and you're doing something, you're going to make mistakes. You're going to get a B on an exam. If you're an A student, you're going to get a B. Might as well get it now and get it over with, <laughs> as I told my son. But you're going to get a B at some point, And you're going to have to learn how to, you know, in a sense, deal with it. And whether it's a B, a C, or a D, it doesn't really matter the grade. But you're not going to – you're going to fail at something. Right. And that if you don't fail, you're probably not very challenged. Mm -hmm. And I think the more you fail and you're really working hard, you're probably pretty challenged and you're learning a lot. And I think you're going to do a lot of good. I'd like to stay on that for a second of of if you're not failing, then you're probably not challenging yourself. Uh, I've heard that before in in the entrepreneurial landscape of of making sure you're challenging yourself. Um, uh, uh, I believe it's one of the Google founders was was saying that about um, he broadcast. I forget which one it is. I think it's Ser- Sergey Sergey Brin. He, he broadcasts his his goals to entire staff, 
And he says, I intend to fail on, on most of these, um, but I know that by falling short on some of these, the success is going to outweigh. Correct. And he's pushing himself and right. he's setting a goal and he's trying to attain that goal. And it's okay to fail. Not all the time, of course, right. <laughs> but it's okay to fail. It's okay to stumble. That's how you learn. You know, otherwise there, there is nothing perfect and that's why there's practice. You mm-hmm. know, the old story, how do you get to Carnegie Hall? Practice. Right. Right. And, and I think that's the same kind of thing. You're going to pick up a, an instrument and you're going to try and you're going to, it's going to sound awful mm-hmm. until it sounds better. Until it sounds better. Um, and on, on the topic of failure, because of course that is something that we hear a lot about, you know, you got to fa- fail forward is another one that I've heard mm-hmm. before. Right. That's a good and, one. And um, what, what I'd like to ask in terms of that is, so when you're failing, not you, but I mean, well, we all have, right? <laughs> we all have. But when, but when you're failing, so for uh, as like maybe a, a tip moment for our entrepreneurs and business leaders out there is when they feel themselves failing at something, um, what are maybe some strategies that they can implement to be able to maybe get out of that rut? Or also, how can they look at it from an objective standpoint and go, okay, what did I fail at and how do I learn from it? What what what? Well, I think the first thing you have to do is acknowledge that you made a mistake or you failed. Mm -hmm. And it's probably not so much a mistake as it is a learning process, right? Be optimistic and and stand up, brush yourself off and do it again. Right. And then stand up, brush yourself off and do it again and keep focused and keep on it and and learn. Most of all, learn from your mistake. You know, don't make the same mistake five times. Right. You know, people will say uh, the the, uh uh, craziness is making the same mistake twice or doing the right. same insanity, thing twice and yes. hope insanity and hoping yeah. that you're going to get a different result. And, you know, to a certain extent that's, that's obvious. Right? right. And, um, but I think you got to figure out what you did, tweak it a little bit and do it again. And, do it and, again. and most of all, don't be defeated. Right. You know, wake up every day, every day is a new day. And, and you may have had a horrible day yesterday. Um, and, uh, as an entrepreneur, I will tell you, uh, well, one of the reasons why they call it work is because you're actually working right? <laughs> and it's, you're going to have some tough days. Yeah. And in the beginning of a business, you're going to have more tough days and you're going to have good days. Right. Deal with it. Yep. And if you don't want to, that's OK. You know, then you can work for somebody else and you can take direction. Right. But if you want to grow, then then get ready to make mistakes, get ready for some small failures and get ready to move on. Nobody's perfect. It sounds uh, to me what I'm hearing there is persistence. Is uh, perfect word. That that's what it sounds like. Is Agreed. is we we hear about failing, but it's the, the the important part is don't do it again, and then be persistent and just keep keep going at it. I'll I'll add one more thing to that. Um, learn how to say no. Mm-hmm. Okay, because as uh, being in business and people are going to come to you with ideas all the time, and you sometimes have to go with your gut, mm-hmm. and you always have to make sure things square. And if it doesn't sit right in your head. There's nothing wrong with saying no. Right. You know, don't feel, don't get FOMO. Right. You know, the fear of missing out on something because right. you said no to it. Uh, sometimes no is a better, a much, much better answer than yes. I, I appreciate you saying that. I'm thinking of Stephen Covey and talking about your, your bigger yes, having a bigger yes to be able to say no. Uh, mm-hmm. For you, how, does, how do you find your way to say no to certain things? Uh, by the numbers. I do my homework. Data? Yeah. It's data driven usually. So somebody gave me an idea the other day and I, I just, my, my initial gut and reaction was no. But I didn't want to do that, right? I didn't want to say absolutely not, it's not going to work and I didn't want to be the naysayer. So I said, look, let me think about that and get back to you. And I spent an hour or so on it. It was mm-hmm. an important person. So it was an important uh, relationship to, to treat correctly, of course, right. any relationship is. So I went back and I did the data and I did a little back of the envelope. I love Excel, just using it as a worksheet and just throwing up some numbers. And if you look at my Excel sheets, you probably have no idea what they mean. And three weeks from now, I may not have no idea. I was going to say, means. I don't have any idea what mine mean. <laughs> right. But, but the good part is, is that while I'm doing it and I'm in that head while I'm watching TV and I'm, and, and I'm playing on a worksheet, I can kind of put some of the numbers together. And then I can go back to the person and say, hey, it's just not a perfect fit. Here's why. Okay. And, and I think it's important because I don't want, I want to evaluate the idea. I just don't want to say no. Right. There is a, there is a physical feeling, a gut feeling, and then, and then you also use data. So you use a balance between the two to make sure that you're making the right decision. Absolutely. Yeah. And there's, and we never know what the right decision is. We just got to make it at some point, right? You got to make it. Yeah. That's what we were saying earlier. Yeah. You have to make that yeah. decision. You have to take a shot sometimes. Yeah. And 
Sometimes you're going to be right and sometimes you're going to be wrong. You're going right. to fall and that's right. okay. So let's walk back a second because we, we've gotten into this really great uh, space of uh, some entrepreneurs do and don'ts. I feel like mm -hmm. more do's than, than don'ts. But I kind of want to go back now to uh, high school or college and, and kind of setting to where you got to personal RX. I think there's a couple pieces of your story there that are very important to this. Well, you know, in high school, um, you know, one of my favorite classes was architecture. I went to school for architecture. I didn't finish in architecture, but I, I, I always had that vision of building things. And I, I also remember my dad one day saying to me, look, if you want to build buildings and be a real estate developer, or do something like that, you can hire architects and you can hire engineers and you just have the vision of what you want to do. And um, so, so that was, that was uh, uh, one aspect of it. But um, I, was in, I was in business when I was very young. I owned a car stereo store and, and um, put it together. Not tremendously successful um, in terms of uh, profitability, but very successful in terms of learning and understanding how to do a business and mm -hmm. kind of hard to start a business when you're 16. Uh, but I did. So let's 16 pause. 16 and a half. <laughs> let's pause for a second. So you started a car stereo business at yes. 16 years old. In Morristown, New Jersey, yeah. That's incredible. I, I used to meet the reps for the uh, audio companies in the diner next door. And I don't think they had any idea how old I was. Um, and, um, you know, like I said, wasn't the most successful journey in the world. Uh, but I loved toys. I loved stereos. I loved music. I loved all of those things. And it was an opportunity in car phones and to put all that together. Um, ultimately, uh, all of that led me to um, uh, working on Wall Street. Uh, and, and it's funny because I had bosses on Wall Street and I had managers and uh, I ended up as, as a director or somewhat of a director at Bear Stearns and then owned my own small broker dealer after that. And uh, I never really worked for anybody. So I'm not the guy that had salaries. You know, I was never accustomed to a salary. And even on Wall Street, I always woke up and on the first of the month, it was zero. You had a donut in the beginning of the month. You had no commissions. You had no income. And what do you learn from that? And you learn discipline. When mm -hmm. your friends are taking off for a couple of days, you go to work. Right. You know, and I'm off on a tangent here a little bit. No, but, you're fine. But yeah. kind of directing back to your question – I think everything you do builds upon everything else. Yeah. And I think you have to have an open vision for all of that. And, um, and so as, as I get to uh, uh, Personal Rx, I never, ever, if you had told me that I was going to own a pharmacy, uh, I, I would have laughed at you. In fact, I had a girlfriend in, in, when I was 18, 19 years old. We're still friends. And her dad owned a pharmacy. And if you ever said to me I would be in the same business as her dad was, yeah. some 30, I would have laughed at you and said, not, not for any bad reason, but I'm not a pharmacist. Right. right? Um, but you go through some life challenges. So uh, my, my children were born. My son it was a twin. My daughter passed away about seven years ago, and in part because of a medication error. Okay. And, and um, so it was tragic. And it, and it – but – it taught me, obviously, what happens when somebody has a medication error. So when the opportunity was brought to me to get into the pharmacy business for, to, to take care of summer camps and boarding schools, and we added boarding schools, of course, to offset the summer camp uh, from a seasonal point of view. But when, when the opportunity came to me, I got involved after running some numbers, again, spreadsheet, um, looking at the numbers, saying, tell me the numbers, talk to me, tell me what's going on, let's build a model, let's build a spreadsheet, and let's take a look at the numbers and see if this makes sense. I got involved in a passive way um, immediately. I said, look, I'm in. The numbers seem to make sense. I get it fundamentally, having you know, been through this tragic experience of a medication error. So what year, uh, what year is your daughter, and then what year is this moment that you're talking about? My daughter was born in 2002. And this moment's probably 2009, 2010. Okay. Okay. So we bought a pharmacy ultimately in 2011. Uh, we bought a small pharmacy and uh, we brought the camp business in and we brought the boarding school business in. Talk about making mistakes. Phenomenal business. I tell anybody about package medication for camps and everybody's like, what a great idea, right? It is. So- But- it's once once you fill you do all the hard work up front, 
And within a three-week period of time, you're bringing on several thousand kids. Right. And you got to ship them, and they go to camp for four or six weeks, and you're done. So that's that was where it started was at a camp, and and you started bringing medication, packaging medication for, for the camps. for the camp students or uh, uh, campers. Uh, campers. Yep. That's how this kind of that's how it started. The the ethos of this started was through exactly. There. And 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 it's interesting because so the first thing we did uh, before we even bought the pharmacy, I put up a website and I built a little website and I put up a website and I talked about schools and a boarding school in New Hampshire uh, called us. This was before we closed on the pharmacy, called us. And uh, we flew up there about a week or two after um, uh, we closed on the pharmacy and we signed them up. And the idea was that you had summer camps and then you had schools. Well, the problem is that the complexion of the medication for summer camps, it was roughly two medications per camper, 1.75, something like that. One of them was a Flintstones or some kind of vitamin and the other one was a real medication. And um, uh, and it was once, right? So we charged a fee, and it was just a lot of chaos for our staff. And it was just, it was, I, I, I for about four years, I had terrible July 4th weekends. <laughs> just trying to figure <laughs> this all out. Um, there, there's, I, I kind of want to go back a little sure. bit to your story here, because I, I understand, of course, it's emotional, and I want to be very respectful to that. But this is the catalyst to everything for you here. Sure. Now, you were an entrepreneur very early on. And as a 16-year-old, I think that you show entrepreneurs that are listening uh, that there's no there's no barrier of age. There's no barrier of entry. No. You can start whenever you're ready and and just start, right? And, and I really think that that's huge for our entrepreneurs to listen to because I know I was just in a conversation on a corporate level of speaking to somebody who's 23 years old at a different company. And the conversation that we had on the corporate level was, well, that person's young. They can't be the one managing the, the situation. And I was thinking of some of the entrepreneurs that you and I have read about, and, and we're going 23. They're old in their entrepreneurial yes, career. Exactly. <laughs> and so when you say you started at 16, yeah, 23, you were like yeah. light years ahead of your 23-year-old peers. Um, so I, I, I think that that's significant for our entrepreneurs to hear and listen to, to that part of your story. But going into personal RX, obviously the impact of your daughter is what led us there, right? So we don't have to go through the emo emotional part, but what happened? It, it sounds like, was she at a summer camp or something? No, it's, she was- What was a, the story there? Well, uh, she was born with a uh, uh, colorectal malformation. Okay. And she went to a, we moved her- at, uh, roughly a week after she was born to a hospital in Long Island um, who, uh, where there was a specialist who took care of this. It was one in 30,000 births. This is what he did. He, he, the name, uh, the procedure was named after him uh, because he was the guy and he travels all over the world to do it and, and so on. Um, and it was about an eight-hour surgery that she needed to have. Mm -hmm. And uh, after surgery, a resident, uh, just a resident and a nurse, Gave her too much medicate, too much morphine. Okay. And uh, so she arrested. My wife was there, and uh, they brought her back, and she was uh, uh, she was never the same since. And, mm -hmm. and it created breathing problems, which ultimately she succumbed to, secretions and breathing issues and things like that. But overall, um, the problem was nobody checked her medicine, period. They just mm -hmm. gave her too much for her size. Right. And nobody did the calculations. I don't think that would happen today. Mm -hmm. um, now for narcotics, you shake your head, but, you know, um, now for narcotics in a hospital, they have machines on each floor and you have to put the weight in and it, the machine calculates and gives you the dose. So I don't think it would have happened today the mm -hmm. way it did then. Right. It was just on the cusp. So I think that's probably that issue probably happens, but a lot more rare. Mm -hmm. But you understand how one little mistake can manifest itself and, and how it can change the trajectory of somebody's life okay. and their health. And, you know, being in the medication business, you get that. You get package medication. People, instead of the machine, people can't make the mistake, right? Because you have exactly what you should have and it's checked. And we go one step further at Personal Rx and part of our service is our medication rec. Right. So we reconcile medications across all your pharmacies. We become the pharmacy. And by doing that, we can make sure there's no conflicts. We can make sure you're not taking two blood pressure medications. And, and perhaps nothing as severe as somebody who's getting a, a completely wrong dose of morphine. Right. But conceptually, it's the same path. 
But that was, and that happened at the hospital. So it wasn't yes. in terms of the prescription. No, being, but no. it's the idea of making sure that somebody doesn't get over medicated or the wrong medication is or under medicated or under medicated. You know, oh, quite often, you know, what we find, we, we do find over medication when we reconcile. We have people with 14 and 15 and 16 medications. By the time that reconciliation is done, they may be down to 13. You say, well, you're losing business because it's less med. No, we're keeping a patient healthy and they're going to be on service for a really long time. Right. And they're going to be healthy and happy. Right. Okay. Yeah, that, I think, you know, sometimes we, you know, we were, I was just talking with these other entrepreneurs recently and we were talking about a, a cloudy moment. As an entrepreneur, you have this cloudy moment and all of a sudden you have clarity. And for you, this clarity came in a different form of, of where it, yeah. it just hit you that you have to do this, this mission. Yeah. So you take these skills and you take this life event and you can put them together, and you can really grow a business. So I want to hear that part. So you, so now we're back to you have the the camp, mm-hmm. and and this kind of comes together. So yeah, it start it starts to come together, and with my partners, I, I'll never forget this. I was online, and I bought the uh, we were called Group RX because camps are groups, right? Groups of patients, and that's why we we chose that name, and. Um, uh, I, I, I don't remember where I was but or what I was doing, but I saw the domain available for $950 for personal Rx, and I bought it. <laughs> My partners went nuts. Why are you spending money on that? I said, that's our brand. That's who we are. Medication, it's about the person. Mm-hmm. We're not going to over we're, – we're, we're in the camp business. We're in the boarding school business. But ultimately, people are older, and they're going to graduate from schools and camps. We want to keep them around, and it's not about their group anymore. It's about their person. Right. And, uh, you know, people say, uh, you know, pivoting in in, uh, startups, some people say it's a good thing. Mm -hmm. Some people look at it and frown on it. Mm -hmm. I don't think pivot's a four-letter word. I've been saying that a lot lately. And we pivoted, in a sense, from this seasonal camp and school business Mm -hmm. to all year round non-seasonal business. And we pivoted from patients who take two medications or 1.75 and a Flintstones in there uh, to people who are taking a minimum of five medications or more. And that's our focus, right? So um, we don't just pack pills. We have a competitor who does that. And we have a couple of competitors who do that. But with us, it's really personal. You get a dedicated care coordinator. Every patient does. Right. You know their name. You ever call a credit card company or a bank and you have to go through your or an airline right. and you go through your story and then they say, hold on, and you get another department, you go through your story again. I, I thought I was the only one doing that. Nah, I, think, <laughs> I, th- I think we've all done it. I think we all continue to do it, but that doesn't mean we can't hate it. And it doesn't mean that there isn't a better way. Right. So it becomes, and people say, well, that's terribly inefficient when you're running a business to have one dedicated person for this. And I said, not really, because they get to know the patient. Right. They get to know the doctor's offices. So when it comes time for your refill and we're calling you mid-month, any changes, how you doing, we're going to ship you on Tuesday. And we say, hi, Mr. Smith. And they say, oh, hi, Larry. How you doing today? And we have that relationship. It becomes a very efficient phone call. And we know when that, when that technician, that care coordinator calls the doctor, they know Jane at the doctor's office, right. Tom at the doctor's office, and they get that script quicker. So it becomes very efficient, and it's a personal experience. And it's patient-centered, right? Why should healthcare in general be so... Uh, putting the patient on the outskirts. Mm-hmm. You know, when, when my daughter was in the hospital, one of the things that I, I always remembered, she was in the, in the uh, PICU for a long time. And in the center of the PICU was a room where the doctors and the nurses all stayed. They called it the bubble, right? So they stayed in there, and all the beds were surrounding the bubble. And the bubble had glass and whatever, and you could see all these people talking and, and what have you. Shouldn't the patient be in the middle of the bubble? Shouldn't the, everybody be surrounding the patient, patient yeah. right? And even if it's just pharmacy, we actually speak to uh, the patients more than their doctors do. We're speaking to them two and three times a month. To understand. Maybe we're over speaking to them, but that's okay. People are on a lot of medication. They deserve that. They're mm-hmm. entitled to that. We don't charge more for it. We charge the same as a regular pharmacy. You're just getting a much better service. You've earned that right. You have insurance. Why not get all those services? Why not have it surrounding? So Personal Rx became a lot more 
than just a group RX and just uh, taking care of kids in summer camp who are having a good time for a month. Okay, and parents who are stressed out and parents who who, who don't want to deal with anything or, you know, um, forgive me. Oh, no, all good. You know, I'm, I'm thinking about the the summer camp and I'm just thinking about how your company started and the summer camp and these kids are taking medications on a regular basis. And so I'm just going to the summer camp for a second here is what what are these what, what kind of summer camps are these? Are these all types of summer camps offer medications and vitamins or is this are these particular types well, of summer we, camps? Well, we dealt with some special needs summer camps. Okay, that, so that's part um, of the reason. But we dealt with a lot of healthy summer camps, as I call them. Okay. Um, not that special needs are always unhealthy, but... Um, but this, where they needed medications. Where they needed medications. Spe- right. uh, special needs summer camps are a lot more difficult because they're only going for a week. Mm-hmm. So to coordinate all their prescriptions and everything and isolate and bifurcate one week from a 30-day supply is very difficult. Okay. Um, the logistics of it are hard. The healthy summer camps where they're going for four or seven weeks up in Pennsylvania, New York State, right. uh, and, and they're, uh, or North Carolina, or where, wherever they're going, and they're having a good time, it's safer to have medications packed. Right. And this way, when they're online for the health center, they get their little packet of medications, they open it up and and they take their meds. Instead of like an 18-year-old cam counselor handing it to Say, them. Say, here, right? take two blue ones, right? <laughs> right. And, and then making a mistake. And they have no clue. Yeah. Um, so I'm thinking, I, I just want to go to your, now you, you buy this website, Personal RX, mm-hmm. and you have uh, you have partners that you Ultimately have, bought out. Who, oh, and that's where I want to go because I want to understand a little bit there because I think that there's something there very important for our, our entrepreneurs and business leaders listening is there, there's an important part that happened there where you made a decision and and maybe they weren't a part of your vision. And I just want to hear how that either played out or what you learned from it. Well, um, I learned a lot. Don't don't go into business with family um, <laughs> or be very, very careful. I'll, I'll, I'll I think that's that on the Ten Commandments, there. by the way. <laughs> uh, it, it should be like number one or two um, in the Ten Commandments. But uh, that, that's one thing I learned. But it, it was really a different philosophy. So I started out in the pharmacy business. I said, I'm in. And I'll make an investment. I'll help you buy a pharmacy. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, what went from a passive investment quickly became an active investment Mm -hmm. um, where I was managing it and and part of the management team. And, you know, I always joke around that democracies are great, but you still need somebody to make in a business, somebody to make a decision. Ultimately, yeah. And um, so you can't argue over that. And, And it's not just experience in an industry. It's just experience in general, what makes sense, what's logical, what's illogical. Mm-hmm. So it came to that proverbial point where somebody had to go. Um, frankly, I thought it was me. Um, we, we were, uh, they, the, the partners wanted to buy the business out. And I said, look, somebody's got to go. And we sat down with the attorneys and the attorneys said, well, um, will you buy them out or should they buy you out? And what would the price be on either side? It would only be fair if it were the same price. And I paused for a moment and I said, sure, up to them. If they want to buy it, I'll buy it. Let's pick a number. Either I'll buy them out or they can buy me out and let's move on. So long story short, we went to mediation to settle on the last, I don't know, $40,000, $50,000, Forty, fifty thousand dollars not a whole lot. We had a mediation day, and they came in to the mediator, and the attorney, the attorney, their attorney came in and said, um, my clients don't have any money. So here we are uh, mediating my buyout and what my numbers were going to be, and uh, the partners didn't have the, the, the investors behind them mm. to buy it. So my attorney said, do you want to buy a pharmacy? You ready to, you ready to, 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 I said, sure, let's do it. And so ultimately, um, yada, 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 I ended up buying the pharmacy and I ended up pivoting off of summer camps. Mm -hmm. Uh, And we just finished our last school. Uh, We gave them plenty of notice. We finished our last schools in January, January 1st. And uh, it's all exclusively individual patients. Yes. Uh, We have relationships with, um, uh, we have a new relationship with Magellan Health. Uh, well, I shouldn't say new. We've been working on it for a year, integrating software and technology and so on. And um, Speak about that a little bit, that, that relationship and, and the software and the technology, because yeah. that leads to where you are today, too. Oh, there's no question. Um, uh, I took a position that some people didn't um, 
uh, didn't really agree with um, with regard to technology. Uh, like I said, part of it is based on the fact that I'm a geek. <laughs> but but I, I, I understand what software can do. And I understand that we're in this business that's not a high value, not a high margin business, right? Mm-hmm. We're in medication. We don't set our prices. The insurance companies do, right? The only thing I can control is what are my costs to dispense it and what can I buy it for? What can I buy it for is really a function of volume, right? right? So I can't really negotiate much else from there. Uh, part of the reason I, I work with Magellan is because if you can't beat them, join them. They're a payer, right? They have 15, 20 million members, and they have 260,000 people that take five medications or more. And it happens to be an amazing relationship for us because they refer patients to us, right? And But from a technology side, how do you take this low-margin business and make it really efficient? So if you read the headlines in pharmacy, you read that the reimbursement rates are coming down all the time. And, and, and the pharmacies are getting squeezed on it. Mm-hmm. And CVS, Caremark, and those guys, they want retail and they want people coming in their store maybe. And mm-hmm. they don't care about making money on those things. They sell toilet paper and everything else. And we don't, obviously. Mm-hmm. And um, so with the margins coming down, the reason why reimbursements are coming down is because pharmacy is so much more efficient than it ever used to be. Okay. Even when I got involved, a reimbursement it used to take 30 days. Now, if you get in the cycle, it's two weeks. Okay. So you're, everything is a lot quicker, and pharmacists can do things with computers and technology a lot faster than they could. So in a sense, reimbursements coming down is not an unreasonable thing. Right. Um, a, a reason, unreasonable concept. So margins came down. We have to be very efficient. We have to onboard. When you're onboarding 3,000 summer patients or 4,000 kids for camp in three weeks, you better be efficient. Right. Okay. And we did it. It wasn't pretty, but we did it. Now we bring on patients, new patients every day, and it's all throughout the year. And it's, But you learn how to bring them on board. You learn that software. You learn what those apps need to do. Mm-hmm. You also learn that there are some older people that don't like to use apps. Right. Right. And therefore, if you don't want to use our app, you don't have to. Call your care coordinator. Call your onboarding person. We'll do it for you. You can use as much technology with us or as little technology with us. It doesn't matter. But behind everything we do is technology, from dispensing to billing to shipping. It's all in one system. Mm-hmm. And it was really important to build that. And it was really important to, to build that in a way that could scale, right? So. Uh, and not we, we, we had a version. We learned a lot from that version. In a sense, we scrapped that version and started over um, uh, two and a half years ago. And we call our system, we've trademarked it, we've patented it uh, uh, and for the intellectual property. We call it RX Squared. Okay. Um, and we have RX Squared Admin, which our staff uses every day. We have RX Squared Mobile for our customers, uh, which includes a reminder app. So Alexa will tell you it's time to take your breakfast medication, um, which is pretty cool. And um, uh, so whenever you go to the doctor's office, you can just hit a button and it'll email them a whole list of your meds and pictures of those medications. So the doctor knows what you're on. So you don't have to fill out that little, uh, the little, I have terrible handwriting. And you fill out that little clipboard when you go to the doctor of your medications and you're misspelling things, whatever. A lot more professional. Send it to them. And so- the technology backbone is really what drives our company. Right. And the relationship with the Magellan is fantastic because they send us weekly, two, I think it's two times a week, we get demographics of patients they want us to work with, and then we get their claim file. Right. And it's right built into our system. So when somebody wants to work with us, they don't have to recite all their medications. We know what medications they filled in the last 90 days, and it just populates in our system. It's funny because you're making me think of like the, the, I'm thinking of so many different scenarios where I've heard this before of like, don't you know what I'm like, don't you know already? Like you should know that. Like, why do I have to tell you this again? And, and what you're telling me is that you obviously have seen that redundancy and have found a solution to that, which right. is what you used to talk about. It's all over your website about we want to make it easier. Want to make well, it easier. That's what it's about. Look, our mission is to improve lives, right. right? Part of improving lives is not just keeping people healthy keeping them sane and keeping it simple, right? Right. So with us, you don't have to worry about anything. I always, and, and this is sort of a negative thing, the way I say it, but it's, it's uh, 
uh, it seems to work. If our patients have to think about medication, we've just failed. Right. Right? They shouldn't have to think about it. I think you're... Yeah. Uh, thanks. Sorry about that. No uh, problem. So I think I, I, th- that's really, that sticks with me, that they shouldn't have to think about their medication. They shouldn't have to think about what's next. The, they should get a call. They go to the doctor. Let us know. Uh, that you went to the doctor, we'll call the doctor, we'll, we'll coordinate the refill or the change. Everybody always asks, how do you deal with change? We don't deal with change. It's our business. It's what right. happens. People change their medication, right? And when you get that box on your door and the guy drops it off, the, the, the UPS guy, and he drops it off and you open it up, you have 30 days, you don't have to think about anything. Did you forget to take your meds today? No. You just you Just look. And if breakfast is still there, you didn't take your meds. Right. right. Really kind of simple. You know, and there's a lot of gadgets out there. And you talk about technology going overboard. There are a lot of gadgets out there where you can fill this machine with all your meds, they say on the ads, a 90 day supply and just fill it in the machine and walk up, press a button, put a cup and it gives you your meds. Well, think, but it, think about that logically. How'd you get those meds? How do you know those meds are correct? Right. Okay. How do you sync up those meds? And, how do you, and then you have to program and tell the machine when you take each med. And then what happens if you're going away? What do you do? Press the machine five times to get, you know, four days worth of meds? Yeah, it's, it's solving the problem like we, of, of just getting the medication one place for you. But it's not like what you said, which is what you're really ultimately, your ultimate goal is to make sure people don't under-medicate, over-medicate or whatever. Precisely. Yeah, and, and that's really the... That's the most important part to the medication. Exactly. Now, look, I, I will tell you that when people get bottles of 90-day supply from mail order, if you look behind it, I, I say this all the time, look behind anybody's dresser right. of your grandmother or whoever it is, you're going to see med, you're going to see pills behind it. It's going to happen, that right? Is, yeah. It's going to happen. I don't care who you are. You're going to make a mistake. Yeah. Um, who's better than having a pharmacist and technology check that for you instead? To make sure. Um, and, and, you know, to that point, there's a lot of people out there that are caregivers, right? And we call it the adult child quite often Mm -hmm. uh, that's taking care of a parent or taking somebody who's sick or somebody who needs extra help or my wife taking care of my daughter um, at the time. There's a caregiver and we make things a lot easier for the caregiver as well. So we built into our tech, we built a caregiver app. Kind of makes sense, Right. right? But not only did we build a caregiver app that you can follow your, your, your mom or your dad or your child or your husband, um, it, for people who are working for healthcare agencies, you can watch multiple patients. Never do the two files match. It's all HIPAA compliant and yeah. so on. And, and never, do they, de, never do they overlap. So you're always keeping people's medication segregated. But you, how, do you know, how do you remember everything that Mr. Jones takes and Mrs. Smith takes? When you're going from house to house, now you have an app that does that for you. You know what I'm wondering while you're saying all this is, do you consider yourself today as a pharmacy or as a technology company? I think we're. I'd like to say first we're a people company, mm-hmm. and we are a technology company, and uh, and, a, and a pharmacy. Right, and I would assume that it sometimes it could be challenging. To, to get everybody on board with with all the the technology and then the, the people in the pharmacy how do you how do you get you know we talk about culture a lot right H- how do you get the culture to understand uh, how this all kind of comes together and it has to work together really well um, good advertising agency <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, what I, I think what I'm asking really is your employees employees uh, it's part of what we do when they start to work for us we go through training and and uh, uh, CVS and Walgreens and Rite Aid and local pharmacies do a great job of training technicians on pharmacy. Right. Right. And what medications are and so on. Pharmacy systems are different at every pharmacy. So ours, from their point of view, is just a different system. And the most important thing is not to get hung up on technology. If we have a customer who or a patient who is, uh, we have a group of patients in uh, southern Florida. Holocaust survivors, and um, they're getting up there, right? And uh, and I will tell you, when one passes, our staff gets very upset. They really do. We have one particular person who gets very emotional. She 
gets very emotional. It's 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 kind of nice to see, but well, like you said, your your staff they build a relationship with their patient, exactly. so yes. they they know this person very well. Yeah, yeah. And so when you see these patients and they're older, these patients are not using apps. They're just not. But we do. Right. We use the app for them. We do everything for okay. them. Okay. So, like I said, they can use any technology they want, or it can be completely transparent to them. Right. And that, I think, is the key. I think it's understanding that. You know, you look at some of these startup companies. Everything is an app. Use the app. And, and they, I guess they consider everybody else to be an edge case, right? So if you can't use an app and you don't have the technology, we just want to get that sweet spot of the mass appeal of people who use apps. Right. Well, our business isn't the mass appeal of people who use apps, right? right. It's people who are a little bit older. The age is getting older and older where people are getting more and more comfortable with technology. Right. Right. My parents, uh, you know, my dad, I think, had a computer on his desk. He never knew how to turn it on. He was an <laughs> old school. He could type. He's an old school guy who could write. Right. But he ever dictate. But he was not a right. he, he was not a, a computer guy. As people are my in-laws now are in their 70s, mid 70s, and um, they get it a whole lot more. And so they're starting to use those kind of things. But even them, they don't want to manage their meds by app. Right. We'll do it for you. You want an alert? We'll send you an alert. We have a built-in system. You can I call it location calendar. You put in your location where you're going to be. It's like, you know, when you go away and you stop your newspaper or you stop your mail and you have it forwarded? Well, we do the same thing for medication. There are a lot of snowbirds out there. It's funny. You're asking a millennial that. <laughs> uh, although, you know, the, yeah, some, of the, some of the true millennials wouldn't call me one. But I was born in 82. And whenever I look it up, it's like the 80 to is millennial. But I grew up Gen X, no, thinking I was Gen X. But now I get grouped into millennial. So yeah, I don't know what uh, I am. So I, I adopted uh, that one. I'm a but, 1966 but when, when baby. That, yeah. When you said to me, you know, when you forward your mail, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of like looking at you yeah. going, I want to be polite, but uh, I also want to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> well, forgive me. Uh, no, no, I'm just You kidding. know, I always date myself these days. I know? did. I forward my mail once, though. When I, when I moved out of my parents' house, I okay. did have to make sure that mail was forwarded to my well, house. Well, you get the concept. <laughs> you're, you want it from point A to point B, and, and they can go in there, and they can put point B, and they can put a couple of dates. You're going to a hotel for a month. Uh, you know, if you're that lucky, um, you can put, you, a you can put it there and we can, we could, we'll automatically ship it there. But you know, what's funny is that actually mail is kind of, I, I would say mail is making a comeback. And I, I think about it because, um, I had read something about a couple of years ago, um, about because companies have focused so much on the online business and on the, on the SEO, which we, we've talked about earlier today, uh, they, they stopped do, sending out the mailers and the postcards and all these other. And there's a huge opportunity for for smaller businesses to do these mailers. A thousand percent. And, and I've actually looked into it for myself, uh, you know, as an insurance broker to send out little snail mail things to, you know, little it's, it's, it's personalized yep. and, and people look forward to it. And a drip campaign works. You yeah. know, that's old school also, a drip campaign, not just an email campaign where you get an email. Right. I get from somebody, I get an email every week from this guy. I finally marked it as spam. Right. And I never like to do that because right. I know what it takes to be a marketer. You know, yeah. it takes a lot to, yes. to put it together. So I don't want to be rude. But I know I have the same enough, guilt. <laughs> right? It's a, it's a guilt thing. And uh, But I will tell you, with respect to direct mail, we're running a direct mail campaign. It starts in May, again, in that Fort Myers area um, and Naples area. It's old school mail. We're sending out three different pieces, one for targeted to caregivers. Right. One targeted to uh, – the other two are targeted. We're doing an A-B to the same list, and see, yeah. we'll see how it works. Uh, one's a self-mailer in an envelope and one's a um, uh, not in an envelope. Mm -hmm. And we'll see we'll, we'll see how it works. I think that there's a tremendous opportunity because my mail, I don't get catalogs anymore. Right. That's exactly right? it. I, I get some. But, but very rare. I, right. And I, I don't get any direct mail anymore. Mm -hmm. So I think when you get it, you, it, it pops out, right? Yes. Even if you're just taking it from the mailbox into your house, you see it and maybe it catches your eye, maybe it doesn't. Yeah, it stands out. So I think there, and, and I also think for us in older populations looking at their mail, you know, so I think it's going to be a, a huge asset. We're, we're, we're testing in this pilot, we're testing a lot of different marketing initiatives, uh, influencers, we're running an influencer campaign. Um, we're, we're not getting the Kardashians involved, but um, sort of the nano and the micro influencers of people mm -hmm. in our age group. We think there's some interesting content there that they can develop, and there are people that use our product potentially. M mismanagement in medication is so easy to happen, and, yeah. and not, by, not because people are 
complicit in doing that. There, mistakes happen. Yeah. What did we say? That people are human, you know? So um, you may take Flomax and maybe let's, let's assume you're not allergic to Flomax, right? And you're not a fall risk because it makes you lightheaded and those kinds of things. Uh, but you're taking eight other medications, two of which do the same kind of thing as Flomax, and the doctor didn't know that because he didn't or she didn't have the benefit mm. of your list of medications. What happens? You know why? Because there's too many different people. So you, you have too many hands and you have too many cooks in the kitchen. And that's the whole concept of having a care coordinator and one pharmacy that has all your meds and knows everything about your meds we know your meds better than your doctors do because you're going to multiple doctors, right? So everybody's prescribing something. So what did we do? We created something called a doctor letter. On the fly, okay, we click off all your meds. We say which doctors it goes to. And it faxes a PDF to your doctors. And in that PDF, it says, Dr. Smith, you wrote for this and this and this. Dr. Jones wrote for this, this, and this, and Dr. You know, Johnson wrote for this, this, and this, and this. So as long as you're comfortable, please sign off and get it back to us. Is this something that happens regularly where they, they, the do other doctors can see what's prescribed, or is this like a whole kind of like new idea? It's a new idea. It's wow. a new idea. And, and I will tell it's a radical idea in that, and it's an obvious thing. I mean, it right. shouldn't be a radical idea. But multiple uh, polypharmacy, multiple prescriptions for multiple providers. And that's where those problems come in. There, there's a few things here that I kind of want to unwrap a little bit. But sure. this one almost is, to me, the most significant, what you just said there about this being a radical idea. When, who do you sit with and where do you get these kinds of ideas that it's, – it's funny because um, – I think back of like sitting around the family table and at a party or something and going, oh, I could have invented that. I could have invented that. And and, and the person doesn't, right? And, right. and we know, we, we don't know the story. Know you're in the story. kitchen and you see the easy little gadget. You're like, I, I, I made this years ago, right? What is I, I it? I bought a lot of those gadgets. <laughs> those gadgets and I bought a lot of those stupid gadgets, by the way. But there, somebody made a lot of money. So it's almost like a two-part question for you, which is um, when the idea comes, and sometimes it's so simple, right? What makes you act on it and go, you know what, it is simple, but it's really necessary. And then two, because you are in a business and you do have, you know, you, you are with employees and, and different people that you're working with and partners and different ways, how do you sit down with them to come up with this idea and formulate a plan to be able to take action on it? Uh, depends on on uh, what it is. So well, if you're let's looking at the example. technology yeah. oh, as well, an example, can, yeah. right? So. Um, we sat down, I knew I needed new technology. I knew I needed an easy way to onboard, uh, which we had, but I knew I needed another way. I needed an app, right? That was a little bit easier for people to use. And we use what's called a progressive web app, PWA. So you don't have to go to the app store and download it. Right. Um, you just put it on your home screen oh, okay. and it yep. lives there and we can update it quicker and we don't have to deal with the constraints of the, uh, app stores. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, so, so that was a piece of technology on how to do it. And you start interviewing companies. And like I said, I do a lot of homework at night, right? And so I'm thinking about what I wanted to do. And I'll sit down and I'll, I'll, I go overboard in drawing up plans and drawing up flow charts and features that I want to work. And they start coming to you. So built into every piece of pharmacy software, most anyway, are a form of reconciliation. OK, in a sense that you can see if there's any conflicts between the meds. All right. But that's just within that pharmacy. And how often is that checked? And what if it's not something that shows up in a computer software or in a database, but it's something fundamental that you should be looking at? Or it's as, as simple as time of day when you're taking the hour of administration, when you take that medication. Well, when you get a bottle, the doctor writes on the bottle, on the prescription, take two, twice a day in the morning, once in the morning, once at night. Well, you have people who take them in the morning. They're not taking it as prescribed. Right. So you just start thinking about these things and how you can implement that in the software. Well, package medication eliminates that. Because if the doctor writes for it at 9 a.m. and 5 p.m., that's how we pack it. Mm -hmm. Okay? And that kind of goes all the way through to the uh, reminders. So you start rolling these things out and more and more of this function comes to you. And the fix for this, quote, radical idea, which is not so radical, is 
have everybody get all of their medications and supplements in one place so that one person can be reviewing it because their doctor simply can't. Right. So internally at Personal Rx, how do you implement that change to happen? How do you how do you go about it yourself? Do you do you meet with a team? Do you how do you get this to take to to go? So what I'm thinking is from the entrepreneurial perspective, or even as a as a business leader managing a team and trying to change something. So there's a system in place that's mm-hmm. tried and true. And, and you have this incredible idea or somebody comes to you with this incredible idea. How do you implement that change in the company now? What's the next step that you take? Well, we have meetings on it and okay. we discuss it. Right. right. So I, I don't like to discuss. It depends on what the topic is. Um, I just brought in a new president and chief operating officer. His name is Charles Ostreicher, and he came from uh, Medco and Express Scripts and uh, CVS Caremark. He was actually... Uh, one of the guys at Medco years ago who built the first automated pharmacy, uh, mass pharmacy that does, I think, a million or two million prescriptions a week in uh, Las Vegas, wow. Nevada. So he, he's he got this experience and this operational experience. So uh, we work in tandem. It's a pleasure to have him. We work in tandem now. Um, I love coming up with ideas and concepts and things, and, and he loves lists. And he's fantastic with his list and, um, and has a list for everything. And that's how we track it all. But I think to answer your question, it's coming up with the concept that, you know, sometimes people don't necessarily see the vision mm-hmm. and you have to sort of explain it to them. And I think you have to explain to them, and, and these are pharmacists, these are clinicians, right? And they're not necessarily business people and they're not necessarily thinking about the totality of the business, and all aspects of the business. Um, give you an example. We asked everybody to change their voicemail, and we gave them a script. And I want it. Cons- I like consistency. I want their signatures on their email to be consistent. I want their voicemails to be. Con- and somebody came back and said, "Well, why don't we just use the automated one, and we can just have it say our name?" And I'm like, "That's not personal. Right. That's not what we do here. It's a you know so." It's that's sort of how you get into the culture, and you, they say, and you, they say, you know, you're right. I didn't really think about that, and that's the totality of the brand. So when it comes to medication reconciliation, you explain, look, well, you've been doing this, and you were trained how to reconcile medications, right? Okay, what you weren't trained on is how to reconcile medications from multiple pharmacies. So if we get our patients to have all their medications here, you're doing nothing but what you were trained on. We're just going to give you the tools to make it very efficient and very simple. Mm-hmm. So instead of looking at this screen or these screens to do this, we can have you look at this one screen in Rx squared, and you can do that medication reconciliation. So showing, really, really showing and giving a, a true example of the benefits of this change is, is what helps with that. Yes. Something that you said in there that I don't want to get lost on anybody is you, you're, you're branding. When you're, when you're talking about the signature and the voicemail and all, you're branding, you're branding Everything's everyone. Branding. And the other part to that is exactly what you said with the automated, uh, just saying the name. You could tell a lot by a person when you get their voicemail and what kind of voice message they have. You immediately know if they're maybe an introvert because you're just getting their phone number or if they're very um, you know, personal where you don't it's even telling, get anything. Right? You, you could learn so much about a person. So it, it really is important when you're talking about your company and this, this culture and, and having this, this congruent brand. Well, well, let me give you another piece of the culture. We have, it, it was, this was a tough piece to put in, to call patients. It's really simple to send, our, our, our system sends a text, okay? Right. Your, your stuff's on the way and here's your tracking number. Um, or uh, we're getting ready to do your, this is your mid-cycle call, we're getting ready to uh, get your package together for, to ship next week. Are there any changes? You can do it by messaging, you can do it by email. But that's not personal. Right. I want them, you know, I don't want somebody to be upset when a patient who's 97 passes away. I don't want that. But I want that relationship because that is our brand. Right. And that's why I, I tell the story about buying the web the, the domain for 950 bucks and getting yelled at from partners. And I, I said, this is our brand. This is really what medicine is about. Right? It's about you. You go to the doctor today. It's you, you want the doctor to talk about you and with you. It's your time. You're entitled to that. Right. Well, you're spending five, six thousand dollars in some form per year on medication, these patients. Our average patient is about five thousand dollars a year now. Mm. Dramatically more than it was for a school kid, right? Um, and rightfully so. They're taking eight, nine, ten medications. But you need somebody to care about you. 
and make sure you're on the right track or your caregiver or so on. And, and that's that's where all that branding comes from. It's really important. It, I, it's it means a lot too, and it, and it and it speaks to the name of Personal RX. The more you speak about it, the more the name even makes more sense, and you think of just. Um, it's personal. personal yeah. 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 You you really think of that. Uh, I want to go to leadership a little bit and, and get your, the way that you lead. And you, you and I talked a little bit off, off mic about Google and, and how you thought they were really brilliant in bringing in, I think it's Eric, right? Uh, Eric Schmidt that they brought in, Correct. you know, and it sounds like you have a very similar relationship with your CEO where you, you work together. You, you see, he has some strengths that, that work to your benefit. Yeah, I, I think part of being an entrepreneur and part of being, I, I, I hate to call myself a visionary, but thinking of the vision of the business and where you want it to be um, is knowing what your strengths and your weaknesses are. Okay, when it comes to detail and filing, I'm the worst. Okay, certain detail I'm really on. But, <laughs> but when it, 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 software and things like that, I'm, I'm, I'm really savvy and on it and, and, and keep the list. When it comes to testing 16 phone numbers for a new advertising campaign and, and drilling down and having everybody do that, um, an operations person is a different mindset. And so when you take somebody who's uh, been in a corporate structure and has all that experience and has some entrepreneurialism in him, he, he didn't want to stay at a big company anymore. He, wanted, he knew he wanted something a little bit different. He actually uh, was introduced to me a year and a half ago. And uh, things just didn't come to terms. And then he called me over, I guess, early fall, and we got together and we had lunch. And I went to lunch, and I told my assistant, I said, I'm bringing on a new partner tomorrow. And I went to lunch to meet him because I knew who he was and what he could do for us. And we, we struck a deal. And it's been a really symbiotic relationship because we, we, we don't step on each other's toes. And in effect, we're, we're not uh, – we work well together because he can do all these things that I'm not a fan of. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and I admit it, right? You, you, you sound like a true creative. I am. I am. Somebody called it the other day when I was talking to somebody. They said you're more of a product entrepreneur. Yes, you, you said a product CEO is what you get the nickname of. Yeah, yeah, and and that's where RX squared comes in, right? right? And that's where the branding comes in. When I was asking you earlier about the different name uh, growing up for entrepreneur, I was thinking back about, about my childhood. Uh, I played a lot with Legos, very similar to you. Love Legos. I still love Legos. Legos. And my favorite part of Legos, and I'm sure you'll probably have the same feeling, is it wasn't about building what was in the package. It was yeah. about building that first, breaking it, and then building my own creation and combining yeah. it with others. I right? used to build stadiums out of my Lego. A- out of any, right? out without, of anything, right? Without, without, without wood, Lego. I didn't care. Yeah. I was fascinated by and the whole idea of a big stadium. I don't know why. Well, you, yeah. it's kind of like what you just said, where the 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 caregivers surround the patient, and that and that's the stadium. That's kind of cool. I yeah. didn't think about I, that. I, but yeah. it, that's the correlation I make for you. But um, I remember as a kid, I used to tell people I wanted to be an inventor. That was that was the idea that I had. But it and and, and it comes out to today where they use the the word creative, where you're you're a creative, and so it sounds like that's what you are. When you're uh, dealing with influencers, they're called creators. Yeah, they are. Yes, <laughs> yeah, it's an interesting uh, difference there. I'm glad you bring them up because now we you're you're moving in. We're moving into a, a, a space where, um, as you mentioned, you, you some of your clientele is is aging out, and you're going to be moving into a space where you have a younger population coming in, and technology is that is it, right? So when we're looking at your marketing and you're looking at your using the influencers, where do you see the business going in the next five, 10 years in terms of all of this? Well, right. And using technology, that is, of course. Yeah. Well, here, here's, here's how I see it. We're in a, medication spend is 500 billion a year, mm-hmm. right? And growing, it's not getting smaller. And I'm not talking because prices are going up. Just people are taking more medication. And population is increasing. And population is increasing. And older people are increasing um, uh, and aging uh, gracefully, hopefully. Uh, $320 million billion or so is in retail pharmacy, right? There are 41 million Americans right now that take five medications or more. Hmm. 12.4%. According to the CDC, it's 12.4% of the population. And that, that number is probably a couple of years old. So when you think about that, that's our market, right? That's our target. Those are targeted patients for us. Um, we are not targeting patients that take two or three medications. Frankly, you don't need us, right? Not yet. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and I hate to be a pessimist, but over time we're going to, you know, we think about somebody who has high blood pressure, right? All of a sudden they're going to take one or they're going to take a statin. They're going to take their blood pressure medication, maybe an allergy pill, maybe a gout medication. I take that, um, you know, or something else, or maybe uh, hypertensive or something. All of a sudden you've got five or six medications before you think about it. Right. And you have to coordinate that. So I think where we see it five to 10 years from now is I think it's going to be that much more important where there are going to be that many more people taking that many more medications. And that's why I really think it's about the patient. And it's not simply uh, buying a machine, having the pharmacy down the block, or even a large company buying a machine that packs medication. That is such the small part of what we do. Anybody can do that. Mm -hmm. And anybody can do that fairly well, depending upon how big you are. You can get efficient. It's mechanics, right? It's logistics. Amazon, it's logistics, right? Mm -hmm. But taking care of that patient that really requires that little extra time and that coordination, first off, it makes good business sense because you have a patient who's who's, uh, annualizing at $5,000 in medication spend, not out of their pocket, but in total reimbursement and so on. And you think about it, and they're on they're on service for ten years, fifteen years. If you do your if you do everything right, there should be no reason why they ever leave you. Right, that's worth fifty to seventy five thousand dollars. So, do the right thing. Take your time, and I think that's I think that's part of this. I and I and I you mentioned about the caregiver, and, and I and I know that that's a really important part of your business. But in that in that trajectory of what you're talking about, and obviously increasing uh, more patients in in your company. How do you scale in terms of your personnel then and, and, and combine that with the technology that you're using? X times Y. Okay, that's where, that's where operations comes in. Um, you know, with technology, we know machines can check packets with pharmacists and you can, you can have uh, – it's, it's an equation, right? If you're efficient and your systems are really efficient, it's an equation. How many, how many – Patients can a pharmacist check in a day, right? Mm -hmm. And it's an equation to say if you have a very efficient system for faxing out to doctors, requesting information from doctors, how many patients can a care coordinator handle, Mm -hmm. a technician, right? And if the number is 300, for argument's sake, could be more, could be less, depending upon the complexity score of a patient. Right. We do that too, by the way. It's okay. a little, little geek thing that I do <laughs> is so that somebody who has five medications and three doctors – is a lot more complex than somebody has 10 medications and one doctor, right? You have less people to coordinate with and get the scripts out on time. And so that variable and that score, somebody, let's assume a, uh, a technician can, ha- a care coordinator can handle 500 points just arbitrarily using mm-hmm. a number. And that could represent 300 patients, right? So now every time you're adding 300 patients a month, you better have a trained care coordinator to start introducing. Now, it doesn't happen all at one time. Right. right? So you always have people that are constantly in training. So you're training staff. We have a trainer on staff, believe it okay. or not, a corporate trainer. And all she does is put together training on empathy, a uh, big aspect of our training. Mm-hmm. Okay. We make people, and I'm getting off on a tangent, but I love this. We make our pay, our, our, any new employee – First thing we do in training in-house is we put 10 bottles of medication in front of them, okay? And there's, there's uh, Skittles or something in there or M&Ms, mostly Skittles. They don't melt. And we put those bottles in, and then you, you, you ask the person, okay, what do I take for breakfast, right? And you see these people fumbling around. Now, they're 10 of the same size bottle. You have to look at every label. You can't say, oh, it's the blue bottle. I take one of those. You can't because they're coming from a pharmacy. So they're mm-hmm. all there. And all of a sudden, people get why we pack medication and how important it is because they, they're making mistakes. Right. Right. So it teaches them, and you speak about culture, it teaches them from the very moment how that they start training how important that how important is. important it is. You know, somebody said we should take it to the nth degree and, and make them use gloves as an older person can't move their hands as well. Or, or put Vaseline or something on their glasses to make them foggy like a cataract to try and figure this out because right. that's what our patients do. So you're always always trying to level up the, you know, the, the, um, the education internally in order to be able to react the way that the patient yes. would react. Yes. Uh, in, in that, I'm just wondering uh, just 
quickly is, is machine learning something that you see in the future for some of this to be able to take over some of this responsibility? I think so. But I, I, you know, I think machine learning is a little, uh, there's a place for it. And some of it is very esoteric and some of it is really mainstream. Mm -hmm. But I think we do some machine learning already. Right. On your board here, if you have something that can set something up automatically, isn't that machine learning? Right. In a sense. Right. So we're, we're sort of taking that term and we're butchering it a little bit, I think. And no different than blockchain. Is the world going to, is everything going to be blockchain and it's going to run the world? I think sometimes these terms get overused. Consultant in the 80s, everybody was a consultant. Right. right? And I think some of these terms in business get overused. And I think AI gets overused. Right. Um, it, it, there's nothing that's going to supplant a relationship with a caregiver, uh, a care coordinator, and a patient. Mm -hmm. You can't replace that. You go to the hospital and you're not feeling well, you still, some, somebody's coming into your room who's a human being. And you can't, yes, you can give them all the technology in the world to make their job easier and make them more efficient. Right. But you can't, you, you can't replace somebody swinging the door open and say, good morning, Mr. Margolis. How are you feeling today? Yes. And you mentioned that in your training where empathy is one of the big ones is, uh, as, as you just said, you, you can train a computer and a machine to, to learn all these different algorithms and different things. But even if they say empathy, like you could, you could get your Alexa to say something very empathetic, but it's not, it's not a person. No, it's not a person. And but that's, think big, about that's that. a big difference. But think about that. Take, peel that onion layer back a little bit on, on Alexa. So we have Alexa that says it's time to take your morning medications, right? But from an, from an empathy point of view, that's great. And however Alexa says it, nice or otherwise, it's, kind, it's fine, right? But who set that up for you? Uh, right. A right? Human. A human. Because you didn't want to do it. You're not sure. You're 85 years old. You don't have an Alexa. Right, your son gave you an Alexa, or your daughter gave you an Alexa for Mother's Day, and turns it on. And said, "This way, Mom, you can say call call Jane. So they'll call me anytime." Right? right, and set it up for them, but they don't know how to set it up. Right, right. So you need the te so there's the technology, and there's an application for it that's great. Right, you don't need this machine. You hit a button on this thing. Says it's time to take your medication. It's loud enough you can hear it. Right, but who set it up? And and that's that's a key difference. Yeah, I think that that is one of the big, big differences in in when we're talking about machine learning is that is to, to kind of remember that that there's a human there. Um, you know, with with the type of company that you have, you are always giving back to the community. You're always uh, obviously a part of a, of a huge community. Could you just um, as we pretty much wrap this up to some extent, could sure. you speak to me about how important your community is to you and, and the people that you serve? It's everything. Uh, that's who we are there for. You know, that's where my empathy comes in. And from, from my ex personal experiences, right. uh, people are, our mission is to improve lives. Okay. That's our mission. That's all over our walls. You'll see our mission statement. And I used to think some of that stuff was really corny when I saw it in offices and things like that. And, and maybe after a while, people get store blind and they don't even see it anymore. But I think it's important because mm. I want it to resonate. How did you come up with that with that phrase to improve lives? Uh, we improve lives uh, is the phrase, and we were in a meeting uh, with a couple of folks last January, and it was a lot longer, and we wanted to shorten it. and And I, I don't remember exactly how we got to that, but it was that's it. Um, I asked that question because I, I have heard of that, you know, mission statements and all these different corporate jargon that get lost, that get that get put into the mission statements, and then it loses its meaning. And uh, and to really sit down and, and brainstorm. So when you when you guys sat down, or when when your people, when you and your team sat down to come up with this, how long did you guys spend on on this idea of being able to find the right phrasing? It actually was fairly quick, it was. quicker than you would think, right? You know, because it, it it came top of the mind to all of us, to the three of us who were working on this, as to what we do every day, right? You know, and I think that's because of the fundamental vision of our brand. You know, one of the things that's unique is how many pharmacies give you your own technician? Well, a local pharmacy, you know Jane at the front desk, right? But on a larger pharmacy, you don't know who that is right. behind it. And how do you take that? Why do people like local pharmacies? They like that personal experience. It improves their lives. It's local. It's easy. It's, it's familiar, right? They have somebody they can ask. They can speak to a pharmacist. They have somebody there that knows their name. 
right? And how do you take that in this age of everything's an app and um, everything is uh, uh, login? And how do you just pick up the phone and call somebody and get some help? Um, we're, we're staying on that thought. Did you get any pushback on such a simple statement? No. No pushback, yeah. No, we have a, a sentence under it, and then we have our core – uh, our, our core thesis behind it, and, and that lowers down transformation, uh, sort of more of the corporate jargon kind of stuff, yep. and uh, co- uh, cooperation, teamwork, and right. all those kinds of things. Well, I ask because I think you know when entrepreneurs are putting together their mission statement and everything, I think it's important. It sounds like when you say quicker than I think, actually to me it feels like you went with your gut. You went with your instincts, and you and you and all three of you stuck to that, and that's yeah. why there was no pushback, and that's why right. it happened so quickly. Yeah. And I think that that's a lesson for our entrepreneurs listening: is that sometimes the first thought that comes to mind is your gut and your instinct it, is the right one. I would say keep it simple, though. I I, I think that's the most important thing because sometimes you read these mission statements and you read them and you're like, what? This is they're selling water. What's this, <laughs> what, is what, this? What, what is this? This forty word <laughs> statement for about selling water? You know, from the glaciers and all. Yeah. You know, I think sometimes people overthink some of this stuff. There's certain things you have to overthink: uh, regulatory, uh, people, uh, technology. Just overthink all Overthinking, that stuff. Overthinking, yeah. But when it comes to a basic idea, it should slam you in the face. And I will also tell you that if I did that a year before. I don't think it would have been as simple. Hmm. You don't have to do it from day one. You don't have to say, okay, this is on my checklist. Let me check the box. And, and you know, if there's one tip I could give anybody besides working hard and, and thinking out of the box is never just check the box. Do the work. And sometimes you can't do the work in the beginning. And that's why I say I think it was fairly quick because we were so um, – entrenched in what we do every day and how we take care of our patients that I think it just came to us that if you were sitting there and say, I'm going to start a business and it's going to be personal because I'm going to use this name and, and it's going to be personal. And now let me think of why we're doing this. I think you're probably going to get stuck. What a beautiful full circle, um, back to dad of work your deal. Yeah. Well, it always comes back to that. It it really feels that way when you said that work your deal. Yeah, uh, Larry, I, I just want, if there's any other um, advice or tips that you'd like to share with our entrepreneurs as we I, I, come to I, a conclusion here, I think that that last shot, one was... Take a shot and work really hard. Work really hard. Yeah. I love and, it. And, and don't take it for granted and don't just check the box. If you want to check the box, you know, get a, get a job. <laughs> I Honestly. love that. Honestly. I love that. You know? That's that's uh, that's how I feel about it. And look, I appreciate being here. I appreciate you uh, inviting me today. I enjoy the conversation, um, and I hope I hope somebody uh, your listeners get something that they can hang their hat on. I, I know that they did. I know that they okay. did. So, Larry, uh, if if you want, can you just maybe just share your your website? This will all be in the show notes and and everywhere else. But sure. just just for the listeners out there, your website or any way of contacting anybody at your on your team. Sure, it's personalrx.com. Great. Uh, really simple. Yep. That's the dot com we bought. That's the domain. Uh, uh, $900. Yep. <laughs> $950. I'll never forget it. I'll never forget the argument. How yep. could you do that? And well, uh, now and this is why. Now it's PersonalRx.com. Very yeah, simple. <laughs> very simple. Very simple. And you know what we do. Well, Larry, thank you so much for coming thank on the you. show today. Thank uh, you. It was a wonderful conversation. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you for listening to The Michael Esposito Show. For show notes, video clips, and more episodes, go to michaelespositoinc.com backslash podcast.